This is a special edition of TransCast, coming to you from the Metrans Transportation Center. I'm Matt Kaplan. All of us who live near the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles share the freeways with the thousands upon thousands of trucks that haul containers to and from the harbor. Most of these trucks are independently owned and operated by drivers who are at the beck and call of drayage companies. Many of these companies are themselves very small. Not much research has been done on how this supremely complex network operates. Dr. Kristen Monaco has attempted to fill in some of the gaps. The California State University Long Beach professor of economics also directs the university's graduate program in global logistics. She and colleagues have gathered data that suggests how dredge might be made more productive, more responsive, and possibly even more green. She has also studied the inequitable distribution of transportation infrastructure costs from city to city and state to state. Her work on trucking labor markets has been published in such journals as Industrial and Labor Relations Review, Contemporary Economic Policy, and the Journal of the Transportation Research Forum. Kristen co-authored Sailors of the Concrete Sea, available from Michigan State University Press. I recently visited her CSULB office to record this conversation about her research. Kristen, thank you for joining us on uh, Transcast from Metrans. Thanks. So we're in your office, but uh, really the focus of your research is a little ways from here. Uh, the research that we'll be talking about anyway, it's maybe 10, 15 miles that away over to the San Pedro Bay ports. I've had a very interesting time reading some of the papers that you've uh, done, uh, some on your own, some with colleagues, about some of the stuff that goes on to make that work at the sort of human capital level. The paper that I'm thinking of first, the research that you did, uh, has this title, Incentivizing Truck Retrofitting in Port Drayage, a study of drivers at the ports of of Los Angeles and Long Beach, published in February of 2008. I guess the gist of this is that you spent some time talking to drivers about the challenges they face. Sure. So this study sort of started before the Clean Trucks program was finalized and enacted at the ports. And the focus of the research was really going down and talking to the truck drivers and getting their opinions on things. You know, when you make policy or policymakers sit down, they don't necessarily try to get a good cross-section of information about what's happening. And so this research was an attempt to provide some data-driven analysis of the current situation with truck drivers at the time, which is back in about two years ago, and also sort of their opinions about how they'd like policy to evolve. I'm sure that decisions made in areas like this are all too often based on anecdotal evidence. They are. If you go to some of these community hearings or even legislative hearings held at community forums, what you get is different special interests who bring in Mm. one or two people who tend to support their side of the argument. So you get maybe three or four people talking, but it's all driven by their particular experience, and they're not necessarily going to be people who are representative of the entire population of, say, a labor force. So how did you get to these drivers? Did you or uh, your graduate assistants or someone just walk up to them at the port? We did. Um, It was me and a couple of grad students, and we got permission from terminals to hang out at the catering trucks that are outside Mm. the terminals. And during breaks, drivers stop there and pick up a bite to eat, and we would offer them a cash payment incentive to do a survey with us. It was self-administered so we could get a decent sample size, and we paid them for the time, which made the catering trucks happy because that generated some, <laughs> perhaps some extra revenue for them, but just really constructed a set of survey questions, most of which were very close-ended to capture a lot of numerical data, but then some open-ended questions to get their opinions about what's happening in the industry, what they'd like to see happening in the industry, and what the particular challenges are that they face. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but based on some of the conclusions that you reached, they probably weren't in too big a hurry, most of them, because they hang out there for a long time just hanging out with their trucks. They try not to, and they tend not to hang out outside the terminals too long. Right? They try to get back in the queue and get in there to pick up a load because that's how they're paid is really on a per-load basis. But there is some downtime, especially when gates are closed for lunch breaks or breakfast or dinner, and that's really when we picked them up in the sample. 
Is it possible? Can you give a fair description of the typical driver at the port? Uh, because I I don't think it's that diverse a group. It's really not. I mean, a typical driver. The characteristics may have evolved a little bit over time, but it still remains the fact that most of them are owner operators, which means that they own their own trucks, which means they're responsible for their capital investment. Um, they tend not to have been born in the United States. A lot of them were born outside of the United States. And they tend not to have a particularly high level of education, most maybe about a high school degree. And they work for, as contractors, these uh, small, usually small drayage companies? Typically small drayage companies. So there is a wide spectrum. You get sort of medium and large carriers, and by medium and large carriers, I mean they contract with 50 or more truck drivers. And then you get some very small ones or maybe just a few drivers that they contract with, three drivers or two drivers. And, yeah, they contract with them. They're not employees. They're not paid like employees. They're paid as contractors. And we're going to come back to those companies because they, of course, have a role in uh, some of the challenges that the companies and the drivers face. But another conclusion that was actually in another of the papers we're going to talk about is that I thought was fascinating is that really the level of education these drivers have, the amount of time, the number of years they've been with a particular carrier, really doesn't matter much. The, these indicators of how advanced you might think somebody might be or, or how well they're doing. Yeah, I think trucking is one of those occupations where there's a certain skill set which is largely independent of your level of education, hmm. right? So you need to speak sort of trucker English. You need to be very savvy with managing your time and things such as this, which you're not really learned in, say, an educational system. So you can't really necessarily think that a truck driver would be rewarded for, say, a college education because it's not really adding to the skill set they need as a truck driver. Likewise, there's not a lot of returns to experience except for maybe the truck driver gets more information so they're better able to choose their load. Just over time, they get more savvy with how the port works. But firms aren't necessarily saying, you mm. have 10 years of experience, I'm going to give you more money per dray. It tends to be very homogeneous pay, but it's how you use your time that can increase your total pay over the course of the year. And speaking of pay, you discovered that, I mean, my impression has always been that these, these guys are just barely squeaking by and in some cases losing out. It looked like your research determined that they might be doing okay, not great, but they sure put in a lot of hours. They put in a lot of hours. It's one of these occupations, and this pertains to port rage, but also pertains to sort of long-haul truck drivers, which is really my earlier research background, is this idea that without necessarily a lot of human capital investment, a lot of education, if you're willing to work really, really hard, and these guys work very long hours, typically around 3,000 hours a year compared to, say, 2,000 hours that we consider a full-time job, if they work long hours, they can make a decent living, which provides some alternatives that they don't necessarily have. People with the same level of education may get a job in the service sector, and the service sector job may not be likely to afford them the opportunity to work 3,000 hours a year at mm. one job and make a certain level of money. So given their education, given their language skills, a lot of them, in fact, do okay, especially once they've paid off their capital investment, which is the truck. You already mentioned that your research took place, the gathering of this data was before the clean trucks program began. Can you describe sort of the general level of the trucks, the the equipment, the tools of the trade that these these guys work with. I mean, they didn't. They really didn't have much incentive to make them cleaner, and not a lot of money to accomplish much with them. Right. But most of the trucks were about ten years old, which makes sense. Generally, these trucks are bought new by these big national trucking companies who use them for long haul, and then they tend to sell off their fleet after about three years of use, then a typical truck would go maybe to a regional firm and they buy used trucks and they mm. use them for about another three years. And then in its third generation of life, it winds up down at the port and it's anywhere from seven to 10 years old. So at any point in time, you can see in the truck distribution, the modal distribution is maybe seven to 11 years old. And I got to think that a 10 year old truck that has gone through that many hands has, do you have any idea how many miles it might have on it? 
Typically, long-haul truck drivers put on about 110,000 miles a year. Hmm. So you can think by the time it gets to these truck drivers, it's very easy to assume that there's about 500,000 miles on a truck. Now, a truck can last up to a million miles. Hmm. But the you know immediate life of the truck is, is just like a car. After a certain level, you can put on a lot of miles, but it's not clean and efficient anymore. Yeah, and they, they may have other problems too, but um, we're mainly here to talk about cleaning them up. The nature, part of the nature of the research at least, was how do you incentivize these drivers to improve their trucks and, and make them cleaner, meet, meet some of the standards that uh, we'd all like to see them meet. There was an interesting finding or two, I think, out of what you discovered they are, are willing to do and how they'd like to go about it. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing is that drivers are actually willing to invest money. And maybe it's not interesting, but for economists, <laughs> we always sort of assume the lowest motivation level. So when we ask people how willing they are to invest their own money to help others, in this case to clean up the air, we would assume that most people would say, I'm not going to pay any money for that because as economists, we're sort of cynical in that way. But these drivers do recognize there's a problem and it may be because a lot of them live in communities near these freeways and they experience the negative effects. Sure, right? their the kids asthma. might be right along the 710. Exactly. So the issue is sort of the fact that they can't completely finance them at the current rates, whether it be retrofitting or replacing the truck. So the question asked of them is, how would you best like to go about cleaning things up? Some of them said that they'd put up about half of the cost of retrofitting, which is sort of a large investment from them. And in terms of replacing trucks, a lot of them indicated that they would really be interested in a subsidized loan program. And this isn't something that we've that's really been enacted in the industry. But it is sort of an issue for them because a lot of them don't make a lot of money. They don't have access to great capital markets. Something that would help the truck drivers a lot is giving them access to capital markets where they could get a decent interest rate on a truck. Hmm. So almost like a microloan program for truckers? Something like that. A lot of the interest rates they pay on these used trucks, right? So this, these are trucks sort of at the end of their life anyway, but they're paying interest rates in the double digits, right? Mm. 14, 15, 16%. That's nothing any of us would think would be reasonable if, say, we were going out to buy a car. Bringing those interest rates down would make the truck payment significantly more affordable. And most of these people, again, are probably fairly good credit risks, they tend to be stable. They tend to have worked in port drayage for several years. And many of them, in fact, have contracted with the same firm for several years. Mm. So there is a potential there. It's not something that's being pursued, but it's something that truck drivers really expressed an interest in. Did you also talk to them about just outright grants instead of a loan? The issue with the grants... And I think they're becoming, as they're more publicized, the truck drivers get more interested, is there are some caveats to the grants. They receive a grant and they have to pay tax on the grant. Mm -hmm. um, they receive the grant and there are conditions on what they can and can't do with the truck. And so I think there's a certain level of suspicion and then just a certain level of trepidation. If I sign this grant, I will have a large tax bill, which again, I can write off against over time but we're not going to get into the accounting measures. But there's sort of this idea that it would be simpler in their minds if they had a subsidized loan versus getting a grant. So still no such thing as a free lunch, obviously. Yeah. Never. Uh, and you're an economist, so we can take that as gospel. So has anybody talked about this kind of subsidized interest uh, program or, or uh, low interest loan program as a possible solution uh, as a part of clean trucks? It's not something to date, to my knowledge, that's been enacted in, in sort of a widespread way. Right now, there's a lot of focus on the grants and subsidies going to the trucking companies. There are some trucking companies in the past that have provided credit for their drivers and operated in that way, but they're the exception rather than the rule. Hmm. Let's go on to uh, one of the other topics that we started to speak about, and those are the, these companies, these drayage companies that... Uh, most of these truckers, these independent contract owner-operators work for. That's sort of a skill-based business, it sounds like, as well. And it sounded like a lot of them, their operations may not be as sophisticated as might uh, grant them greater productivity. Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, they're highly variable, but this is 
again, speaking as an economist, a great example we give our students of a perfectly competitive industry where there's low barriers to entry. Mm. Almost anyone can start up a drayage company because you don't own the trucks, therefore you don't have as high of a capital investment. This encourages, I think, over-entry into the market, which destabilizes the bottom end of the market, right? There are very good, very well-run, very reputable drayage companies, and they wind up competing with these fly-by-night operations that come into business, leave the market, but these people pull down the rates that they get. Supply and demand. Exactly. So some of the companies, though, they're apparently not using the techniques to just manage their work, to manage all these trips in and out of the port made by their owner operators in the most efficient fashion. That's true. There's sort of a few holdups. The first is the firms, the drayage companies communicating with the drivers, which tends to go very well because of how owner operators are paid by the load. The owner operators always want to be moving. So it's easy for the drayage firms to say, okay, here's your next dispatch, and they can get decent productivity out of the drivers. The holdup, of course, is when they get down to the terminal. Mm. You need to make sure they get in and out of the terminal in an efficient way. And the drayage companies don't have a lot of control over how the terminals are run. So it does become tricky, even with an appointment system. That tends to work well for, say, the first appointment of the day, but there's so much variability in taking, picking up your first load, getting it to delivery, and then coming back down that the time uncertainty becomes higher and higher, and there tends to be a lot more waiting as the day goes along. What kinds of waits did you see uh, truckers just in the queue waiting to pick up a, a container or two? Well, I don't see a lot of those because a lot of that happens inside of the terminals Mm -hmm. because of these truck idling laws. But when you ask the drivers, it's still about 45% of their time is spent waiting. So this is a huge sort of opportunity for a productivity improvement is getting them in and out of the terminals faster. But this is held up by all sorts of operational characteristics, not just the drivers who want to be moving or the drayage companies who also want the drivers to be moving. But there needs to be everyone working together to get these loads in and out quickly. Um, You can think of sort of getting a cab at the airport, Hmm. right? If you want to go someplace, maybe they have cabbies going in different areas. So if you're going to Washington, D.C. and you're flying into Reagan, they'll ask you where you're going. And they have different cabbies that deal with different areas. But generally speaking, any cabbie can pick up any fare. Mm -hmm. At the port, one driver is picking up one particular container, You can think of if there was a more efficient, any container going out to the Inland Empire, for example, Hmm. that could be picked up by a driver driving out to the Inland Empire because of insurance issues and liability issues and the structure of the industry. This doesn't happen, but it would be a much more efficient way to get containers in and out of the ports. Is part of the problem that at the port as well, you've got all these different terminals with independent operators. I don't know how much coordination there is uh, between them in terms of getting their containers out on the road. There's really not. You know, a lot of the containers are stacked. They have to go find the right container, hook it up with the correct driver. And a lot of that adds to the waiting time, as one would expect. Considering the millions of containers, tens of millions, that pass through those two ports, it's amazing that the system works at all to a degree. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you can complain and talk about where it could be improved, but the fact of the matter is it is sort of staggering to watch the amount of goods flowing into the region that we see. Yeah, and we've said before on on this in our companion podcast, ContainerCast, anyone who ever has a chance to go down and watch the port in operation, it's something that is almost behind a curtain for most of us, and it is an absolutely awe-inspiring sight to get a feel for the scale of, of what's going on there. It is amazing. We try to encourage our students to go down there. It's amazing how many students go to Long Beach State and have actually never even driven through the port of Long Beach, maybe just crossing the two bridges to go between Long Beach and San Pedro. You do get a good picture of what's happening down there. That's all I ever did for years. When you mentioned that 45% wait time that at least you heard reported by the drivers, that was even after the Peer Pass program, which attempted to spread that traffic out across more hours of the day? It is. Obviously, now the volumes are lower, probably they're getting faster turn times. Um, But yeah, at the time, 
there were waits consistently throughout the day. But the uh, drivers also, as a result of Pure Pass, segregated themselves into different shifts. So hmm. you actually got a lot more people wanting to work at night trying to get that extra turn in, which creates congestion at night. That's interesting. Yeah, unforeseen problems. Back to the companies that uh, that's, uh, bring these owner-operators into the port. Some of the smaller ones, uh, I guess I'm back on the topic of greater efficiencies, greater productivity. Uh, I think you discovered that a lot of them are still using pretty primitive techniques for uh, assigning these uh, drivers to pick up loads. Sure. There's not the logistics involved in, say, a UPS or a FedEx, Hmm. Mm -hmm. which is not surprising. If you have a small firm, you're not going to invest in that technology There are arguments made that if we had fewer larger firms, it would be more streamlined. Even because you have more loads being handled by a particular drayage company. So you send the driver for the next available load, not a particular load. But also better routing technologies presumably would exist and better tracking technologies. Um, And that's something that is not going on right now that does have the potential to exist. I'm going to go to sort of a different chapter here and and really a different paper as well. Uh, Another one that uh, you uh, co-wrote with Jeffrey Cohen uh, from the University of Hartford, uh, which came out in March of 2006. And this was uh, on a much broader scale, uh, looking at sort of uh, resource differentials between states. I mean, states that have ports and states that don't. And some of the things that take place because of the interaction between those. Is, is that a fair description? Sure, absolutely. I think any time you go to any community event related to the ports, you get this statement of, we have all these negative externalities or negative consequences from the ports. And then this benefits the person in Peoria who's hmm. going into their Walmart and getting the cheap good. And I'm originally from the Midwest, so I, <laughs> I can identify with my family in Milwaukee getting cheap goods as a result of our ports operating out here, and they don't have to deal with all the, the pollution and the congestion. And so this paper, and we had a follow-up paper looking at things at the county level, but this paper was really trying to quantify what the external benefits are to adjacent states from having a port next door. So we know that having ports benefits California. Having ports in California benefits the state. We know it generates jobs, and the ports do a very good job of publicizing that. But the ports in California also really help out Nevada, for example. Mm. So looking at sort of how investing in transportation infrastructure can benefit other states, not necessarily in terms of ultimately trying to tax them, but just trying to sort of identify where those positive spillovers exist and how large they are. But you actually do mention, and you put it in quotation marks, this possible solution of a state like California, where the ports are, and a lot of infrastructure, highways and so on, taxing another state. And it seems to me there's something in the Constitution that says that might not be acceptable. Oh, that pesky Constitution. (laughs) Now, you know, we have advantages and disadvantages in the United States. One of perhaps our disadvantages is we don't have a national port policy. Obviously, in the state of California, we don't even have a state port policy. Hmm. Other countries, such as China, develop sort of a grand scheme for infrastructure, right, on the national level. And obviously, we're not allowed to do that here. And there are, you know, constitutional issues. But for that reason, we don't have a national ports strategy. And a lack of a national port strategy leads to perhaps overinvestment of ports in some areas and underinvestment in other areas. Obviously, landlocked states you can't do anything about their investment in ports infrastructure. But if they are accruing benefits from us, but not the costs, there is this idea that somehow you need to spread those costs. And when we talk about taxation, I think what we're really talking about is what we're seeing in California, which is if you add fees, Ultimately, what you're really doing is taxing the end user. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that is how you would pass some of these costs along to, you said, Nevada gets enormous benefit from our infrastructure that they don't currently have to maintain. Sure. All of the container fees and user fees and all of these fees that have been proposed and will be proposed more in the future are really attempts to get the end user who benefits you know, whoever's buying the good at the Walmart, Mm -hmm. to pay for what's going on out here. But isn't the market already doing that? Or is there sort of a divorce here between the infrastructure 
and what the market might support in this way. There's definitely a divorce, right? There's this pressure in the market for, yeah, and to keep banging on Walmart, but you know, it's one of <laughs> these situations. Everybody does. Everyone does. It's it's very it's very cool to do it. So. People want their cheap t-shirts in Peoria. Walmart's very focused on their bottom lines. They're going to mark down as far as they can go. And what happens there is that there's not necessarily a recognition of all of the true costs of getting that t-shirt from China to Peoria. And these container fees and other fees are really an attempt to increase the price of that good, not altogether that much, but to recognize that there are negative costs that we have to correct for at some point. They're not sustainable that we can have all of this congestion and all of this pollution and have it go on forever. At some point, it needs to be mitigated, and somebody needs to pay for it. I really am fascinated by this stuff, and I get the feeling that you are as well. Well, it's it's interesting, and our follow-up study on this state infrastructure was a county-level look at just counties within the state of California. So, for example, L.A. County, which has the ports, I assume Orange County is getting some substantial benefits. Absolutely, and Riverside and San Bernardino, again, mm, sure. before this necessarily this recent economic um, turnaround. But the warehousing and distribution sectors growing in those counties is a direct result of the ports located here and the fact that they have relatively low land values. So they grow as a result of our port activity. They get some of the congestion and pollution as a result. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they don't have the negative externalities that result in the county of L.A. But the county of L.A.'s investment does benefit other counties in California. The same thing up in the Bay Area with the Port of Oakland. There was a sentence in the conclusion to this report, uh, which I, I hope you can shine some light on for me. Finally, we find no significant relationship between the shadow value of ports and highways, highways infrastructure, or the shadow value of highways and port infrastructure. So I see the switch there, but really, what are you talking about? I think what we're saying is when you invest in ports, you also need to invest in highways. They're complementary. Mm. They're not at all substitutable for one another. So if you suddenly can handle 10 million more TEUs, you better have the roads or some other way of getting them someplace. Absolutely. And this is what we were seeing up until about two years ago when we started getting a lot of congestion with the 710 and and the rail and the Alameda corridor, either end of the Alameda corridor. This idea that we can make terminals more productive by stacking containers and extending terminal hours and days of the week, but if you don't have the road capacity, if you don't have the rail capacity, then it does the community no good. I'm going to throw one curve at you, which is not really in any of uh, the material uh, of yours that I read. But as an economist, what do you think of the uh, tremendous investments that are talked about by some for improving, in particular, the, the highway infrastructure, the concrete portion of the infrastructure? I mean, for example, uh, we're speaking in your office at Cal State Long Beach, where there is some exploration of using magnetic levitation to get stuff from here to the high country to Riverside. Pretty expensive proposition, though, I'm sure. Incredibly expensive proposition. Everyone likes the idea of maglev. I mean, it's really cool, right? It's very sci-fi oriented. They're levitating. There's not even wheels involved, right? This is, this is new. It's incredibly expensive. There's other alternatives, right? Electrified rail, which sort of takes advantage of existing infrastructure to also move things at high speeds. And some of the work that Ken James does in this field is interesting. Yeah. The magnetic levitation, given the current economic situation, I don't think is really moving any place um, in the near future. But there have to be alternatives that are clean and bypass the current road congestion because of the physical layout of L.A., we're not going to get a lot of widening of freeways, right? Mm -hmm. You can think about double-decking the 710 or whatever the plan of the moment is on the 710, but then eventually these trucks go off the 710, and they're on the 91 or they're on the 5, and the issue is how you deal with those choke points. Given sort of geographical constraints, it does seem that somehow innovating rail and making goods move more quickly on rail would be the solution. So even if at the moment uh, the demand, the need for this 
infrastructure improvement may not be quite what we thought it was going to be a couple of years ago. Is there any doubt in your mind that we're going to see that demand right back where it was and, and higher? Some of it definitely, right? A lot of the goods coming in to the port are consumed or manipulated in some way in Southern California. We know that there's a very large population in Southern California, and let's extend this up to Central California because we're sort of the halfway mark. We know that there's a certain amount of goods that are always going to come in here, right? And that is a large number of goods. There's also goods that come in that are further manufactured here, transformed in some way. They could be repackaged here in warehouses. That also is occurring in Southern California. Until those facilities move or until our population goes away and the latter is not going to happen anytime soon, you still have a very large market area here that's going to be served by a port. So you can think about the fact that even with the development of mega ports down in Mexico or the expansion of the Panama Canal, mm. that can take away some of our excess. But there's still a very strong market here and these goods are not going to go down to Mexico only to be brought back up to California, especially not with current border crossing issues. And with prosperity just around the corner, we're coming out of this recession, right? Hopefully. <laughs> and demand should be up again, and cars should be coming back in, and textiles and electronics. And we're not quite seeing that yet, according to census trade data, but hopefully relatively soon. Uh, you seem to get a good deal of enjoyment out of uh, working in this area. Sure. It's a way of combining sort of the academic side of research with something that's sort of topical and interesting and pressing public policy issue. Kristen, thanks very much. It's been a real pleasure talking to you today. Thank you. Kristen Monaco is a professor of economics and the director of the graduate program in global logistics at California State University, Long Beach the partner to USC and the Metrans Center. Her research focuses on the relationship between market structure, institutions, and labor market outcomes. She is a co-author of the book, Sailors of the Concrete Sea, available from Michigan State University Press, and I happen to know there's a copy or two left on Amazon. Uh, what an interesting title. I mean, to prolong this for another moment or two, do you see real parallels between the traditional sailors of the high seas and those who drive on our freeways? I think the romantic aspects of truck driving are very similar. My origins of research in this book is really centered on long haul truck drivers in the Midwest. Mm. And these are truck drivers who are driving from, say, Virginia to Montana, for example. And they really see themselves as sort of on the open road. They're their own bosses. They love this job. So, yeah, there's a certain amount of I get to go see new venues and do new things. Well, that's a big 10-4, Kristen. <laughs> Thanks again very much for joining us on Transcast. Thanks. This has been a Metrans Transcast. Metrans is funded by the United States Department of Transportation and the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans. We hope you'll join us for the next edition of Transcast. <laughs>